Welcome, and thank you for joining today's National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee meeting, also known as NISPAC. To receive all pertinent information about upcoming NISPAC meetings, please subscribe to the Information Security Oversight Office's Overview Blog at isoo-overview.blogs.archives.gov or by going to the Federal Register. All available meeting materials, including today's agenda, slides, and biographies for NISPAC members and speakers, have been posted to the ISU website at www.archives.gov slash ISOO slash oversight hyphen groups slash NISPAC slash committee dot HTML and have also been emailed to all registrants. Please note not all NISPAC members and speakers have biographies or slides. While connecting by phone is necessary to attend today's meeting, there is no requirement to log on to WebEx. However, you are welcome to join WebEx with the link provided with your registration, as all available materials will be shared during the meeting on that platform. If you have connected through WebEx, please ensure you have opened the participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. All links will also be shared periodically through WebEx chat. Please note all audio connections will be muted for the duration of the meeting, with the exception of NISPAC members, speakers, and ISU. We are expecting a fairly large audience today. Because of this, we will not be taking questions from the public over the phone. Please email your questions and comments to nispac at nara.gov, and someone will get with you there. Only ISU and NISPAC members will be authorized to ask questions throughout the meeting. At the conclusion, a survey will be provided for feedback. If you would like to be contacted regarding your survey responses, please include your email in the comments box so the NISPAC team can get back to you personally. Let me now turn things over to Mr. Mark Bradley, the Director of ISU, as well as the Chairman of the NISPAC. Thank you so much, Madam Producer, for your kind introduction and uh, your instructions. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 68th meeting of the NISPAC. This is the fifth NISPAC meeting that's being conducted 100% virtually. This is a public meeting. Like our previous NISPAC meetings, this will be recorded. Recording, along with the transcript and minutes, will be available within 90 days on the NISPAC reports on committee activities webpage mentioned earlier by our event producer. We're planning on a five-minute break in the middle of the meeting, which I will flag as we move closer to, to it. Um, I will now begin attendance for the government members. I will state the name of the agency. The agency member will reply by identifying themselves by name. Once I have gone through the government members, I will then move over to the industry members. After the industry members, I will then proceed to the speakers. All right, ODNI. Good morning, Mr. Bradley. It's Valerie Kerbin here. Good morning, Valerie. Department of Defense. Hi, Valerie. Brad, thanks. Department of Energy. Good morning. Natasha Sumter is here. Good morning. NRC. Uh, Dennis Brady. Good morning, Dennis. DHS. Good morning, everyone. This is Rich DeJothra. Morning, Rich. DCSA. If you're, you're faint there, uh, but I, I got it. CIA. Good morning, Felicia here. Morning, Felicia. Department of Justice. Good morning, Kathleen Berry. Morning, Kathleen. NSA. Brad Weatherby from NSA. Morning, Brad. Department of State. Kim Bauger, State Department. Morning, Kim. Department of Air Force. Good morning, Jennifer Aquinas, Department of the Air Force. Morning, Jennifer. Department of the Navy. Department of the Navy. Uh, would you please identify yourself by, by name, please? Yeah, Department of the Navy, Steve James, primary, primary representative. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, Department of the Army. All right, nobody from the Army. 
All right, I'm going to now turn to the industry members. Uh, Heather Sims. Yeah, I'm sorry. Elizabeth O'Kane from the Army. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. All right, I'm now going to turn to the industry members. Heather Sims. Heather Sims, industry president. Great. Rosie uh, Burrio. Rosie Burrio, president. Great. Cheryl Stone. Cheryl Stone, present. Great. April Abbott. April Abbott, present. Morning. Derek Jones. Derek Jones, present. Great. Tracy Durkin. Tracy Durkin, present. Great. Greg Sattler. Greg Sattler is present. Right now, I'll do a quick roll call for the speakers. Make sure we get everybody lined up. Eric Person. Yes, sir. Good morning. Eric Person's here. Morning again. Chris Heilig. Good morning, Chris Heilig. Morning, Chris. Bob Mason. Good morning. Bob Mason's here. Morning, Bob. Chris Pollock. Good morning. Chris Pollock is here. Great, Chris. David Scott. Scott present. All right. Donna McLeod. Good morning. Donna McLeod is here. All right. Paul Dufresne. Good morning. Paul Dufresne here. All right. Terry Russell Hunter. Terry Russell Hunter for Doha is present. All right. Thank you, Terry. Right, if anyone else is speaking during the NIST pack that we have not heard from or I did not know about, please speak now. Mark, uh, this is Greg Pannoni. Just for the record, my, our colleague sitting next to me, Jeff Spinninger, is here, and he is representing the Department of Defense. Okay. Morning, Jeff. All right. <clears throat> Again, we request that everyone identify themselves by name and agency if applicable before speaking each time because this is being recorded. And then, as you all know, we do a transcript. and just makes it a whole lot easier for us if, if we don't have to try to guess who's, uh, who actually talked. Uh, I want to provide everyone with our agency's quick uh, quick COVID update. Uh, and for a month now, we've we've uh, not had any restrictions on in-person meetings for NARA staff and all NARA buildings. However, most of our staff is still uh, teleworking, although we are moving into much more of a hybrid state, uh, as I'm sure a lot of you are too. Uh, we do not yet know if large gatherings such as the NISPAC working groups and the next NISPAC will be in person uh, because D.C., Washington, D.C. is now at a medium COVID transmission level per CDC guidelines, but obviously we will keep monitoring that, and I personally hope very much we can uh, dispense with this virtual meeting and, and, and move into actual face-to-face -face like we used to, but that's um, to be determined. Additionally, uh, we've had a few changes to the MISPAC's membership. Dr. Jennifer Obanier, the primary with the Navy, has left. She's replaced by Steve James, who's on this call. Additionally, the NSA alternate Shirley Brown has also departed. She's been replaced by Blaine Bucci. The NSA uh, primary, um, I'm sorry, the NASA uh, primary, uh, Kenneth Jones, has departed as well. At this time, a replacement has not yet been designated. Uh, lastly, but, but also critically for, for uh, Austin Isu, uh, most of you know Greg Pannoni, the designated federal officer for the NISPAC. This will be his last this back meeting before he retires this summer after over 42 years of federal service, of which more than 17 of it was spent here in, in ISU. Greg has been an integral part of the NIST community. Uh, he's been a, a marvelous deputy. I couldn't have asked for any, a better one, and uh, he's uh, um, just virtually indispensable. Say he will be sorely missed is an uh, understatement. Greg, thank you for your dedicated lifelong service, and obviously we wish you the very best, um, and we look forward to you know, continuing the work that you've done uh, most of your professional career. Thank you, Mark. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be involved with this pack many all these years and even before when I was with DOD. Um, partnership is invaluable. You know, I think many of you that know me know that I've embraced that from the beginning, uh, it doesn't make sense to do it any other way uh, to involve critical stakeholders. Um, so uh, I hope to continue to working with all of you. Um, I do have a couple of uh, things. While we didn't have any real formal uh, action item from the last meeting, uh, we did have one, and then there's the NISPAC minutes, which were certified from the last meeting, to be true, correct, accurate, that was finalized on February 2nd, and 
next item, uh, a colleague from DOD recommended that we return to three meetings a year. And uh, while we think that's a great suggestion, um, we are not in a position at ISOO to do that at this time. Uh, this kind of falls in line with another item I wanted to mention. Uh, we have two vacancies right now, and we have those filled by the time we have our next NISPAC meeting, which will probably be in October. Uh, once the dust settles on that, hopefully we'll be better resourced to uh, consider returning to the three meetings a year, uh, which I think is an excellent idea. So there's that. By the way, this is what, two and a half years since we've had sort of a semi-live meeting, and to paraphrase uh, Frank Sinatra, there's nothing like having live meetings. Uh, it's good, but we have to deal with the technical stuff as well. Um, we have those two vacancies. Uh, one is for the CUI lead in ISOO, uh, Heather harris McCann, who has been doing a great job on the uh, NISP work as a senior lead for that in ISOO. He's we're in both hats right now, and she's doing a great job helping out with our CUI. We hope to have that position filled. And then we also have a chief of staff position open. One, one last thing you should know, uh, someone, shall I say, uh, more noteworthy than me, is retiring effective April 30th, and that is the Archivist of the United States, David Mario, who served for more than 12 years. And uh, so we'll have an acting uh, deputy archivist. Ever steel wall will act, act for however long it takes the Senate to uh, nominate, confirm the President to nominate, and the Senate to confirm the new archivist of the United States. Uh, David has been a <clears throat> great advocate for openness uh, and use of uh, technology to convert records to uh, digital. And you know, you may ask why I sue and R. Well, at the end of the life cycle of classified information, it gets declassified, right? made available to the public. So that's the core of NORA's mission is openness and records. So with that, uh, are there any questions? Okay. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to the chair. All right. Thank you, Greg. At this time, we'll now introduce our speakers for updates. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Heather Sims. The NISPAC industry spokesman will provide the uh, industry update. Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Heather Sims, industry. Um, speaking, and I, it was sure much easier doing this in my, my basement in my PJs the past four times, I'll say that. Uh, definitely a lot different, um, actually, it reminds me of that I'm truly representing industry in this role. It's definitely been a long two and a half years. I have a year and a half going, I have to go on this side. But it's definitely been a pleasure um, representing you at the national level. Um, it's not easy by any means. I do want to thank the other industry news type members for all the countless hours that we were on the phone and were collaborating, making sure that we're truly representing the industry at large, on those small, medium, large companies. And this year, we're trying to be more transparent in our efforts. Um, there's many companies out there that are not represented by um, the MOUs that support us. So we did create a newsletter to talk about who we are, what we are, and what we're trying to do. We pushed it out through all five CSAs um, to make sure that we're reaching those companies who have no idea they're represented at the national level um, of the policy. So if you know somebody who doesn't know about NDIA, um, all the MOUs that are out there, or what Industry Next Pack does, please send, this, send them up so we can make sure we can get them involved one way or another. I also want to thank the um, MOU members to the uh, Industry Voice Pack. Um, without you, we wouldn't make sure that we have that uh, industry voice collected. Um, it starts with um, the working groups, um, the collaboration, making sure we get the right people in the right working groups with the right skill set. So thank you for sending those names so quickly um, along the way. Um, I also want to thank um, Greg Pannoni for your years of service. Um, I was a little lost when I first started. Uh, so he gives me the vector checks that I need to make sure that I'm doing the right thing along the way. So thank you, um, and happy wishes on your retirement. I also want to thank, um, and I know Matt Eames is in the room, and you're going to hear from him later. Today. So we started something about two years ago that wasn't done in the past, making sure that industry had a voice proactively when it comes to national-level policy. 
um, specifically talking about personal security reform. So, Maddie, thanks for your continued collaboration with industry to review those documents of the uh, historic personal security reform. So, we do appreciate that. Um, I want to be mindful. Um, we talk a lot about DOD, DCSA, um, on the stage about what's going well and sometimes what's not going so well. There are four other DCSAs out there, and I want to thank them along with DOD. We do have issues, we have concerns, and we have to reach out to them. Thanks for your quick responsiveness. Um, it really, truly matters to get industry um, responses to the questions or guidance implementation um, in, in a quick manner to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And speaking of DOD, um, and in this case DCSA, um, this past year we worked collectively as industry and hopefully you were reached out to to collect um, what was going well with the 32 CFR implementation. We rolled up an industry report, an after action report of how well the 32 CFR rolled out the DOD oversight and implementation. And uh, we sent that in uh, to DOD, um, uh, to DCSA, as a guideline on things that we can work on together. What needs to be further clarified in the 32 CFR? I don't know if anybody else read it as many times as I did, but it is not an easy read. And every time I read it, I find something different that I thought I knew. So thanks to DCSA on um, um, providing that quick clarifying guidance when we need something um, in the industry to make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, if you haven't seen that after action report, I'll make sure you have it um, before we leave uh, the conference. It is, we want to be transparent, we want to make sure that we're providing um, the results of the collection from industry um, as, as far and wide as possible. But we're going to try to continue that trend every year on how, what's going well and what's not going so well so that we can share those lessons learned and uh, not repeat the, uh, the issues from our past. So thank you all for who provided those in. Now, uh, those who know me and heard me speak before, I will always say good things, but then I'll always put a little things that we can do better in there, and then I'll roll that up with some real good things. So while things are going really well and we have some good collaboration going on, we can still do better. Um, and I'm going to talk about, uh, we had a lot of discussion about NBIS, but I'm going to open that up just a little bit more. That's every system that the federal government provides um, that industry has to touch. We have to do better to make sure that we have a strategic plan, um, we have to have a great communication plan, and that plan has to cover how um, we're going to interface with those systems at every level. Oftentimes, industry is an afterthought. Um, system requirements are built for government stakeholders, not necessarily industry stakeholders. We have to do better. I myself came from the government. I thought I knew what industry needed. Rude awakening when I came out and couldn't get into this. Um, and after four months, it was pretty difficult. So making sure that we can test things in our environment to make sure that it works for all industry um, partners that are out there. Many of us spend countless hours doing administrative work typically to fix a system that uh, we didn't create. So I will say that I didn't talk all about uh, NBIS, but any system that uh, the government provides to us, we really need to do a better job there. I will say one of the issues that we're, we're really concerned about um, now is the JPAS that this transition, um, we, we surveyed about 200 and, and approximate 250 um, industry companies, and it was well into the millions of um, resources and man hours that industry had to eat up the cost to help get that data integrity, that system correct. And our main concern right now is that's going to be the same uh, for the this to the uh, end this transition. So while we're trying to meet a timeline, we want to make sure that we have an effective trusted system that industry does not have to fix our own data. So uh, without a doubt, we all want to get to one system pretty quickly. Um, we don't want to operate in two systems, but again, we want to make sure the system works. Now on the positive thing, uh, there has been tremendous amount of work done on the personnel security front. Um, I remember coming to the conference as a, a government member, and that is all we talked about, how bad the personnel security investigation process was, how bad the adjudication process was. So thank you to, um, I will say, DOD at large, um, and specifically um, VROC adjudication and the personnel investigation piece of that. Tremendous ground uh, has been made, and industry does appreciate that. 
Um, I talked to Heather Brienne a little bit last night. She looks more relieved at these conferences now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not in the hot seat. So that is, that, that's a lot of work. The industry was instrumental in making sure um, the improvements were made there as well. Not that we're going to keep our, our eye off of those timelines, and I know we talked often about reciprocity and transfer of trust, but I'm very hopeful that Trusted Workforce 2.0 will get us to where we need to get to. But keep in mind, I learned just the hard way also, is um, industry can move um, at, at a very fast pace. Government does not move. Um, so I'll be retired probably once we get to um, FOC on Trusted Workforce 2.0. So hopeful, I will say. Um, and with that, um, a couple other things that are going very well. The collaboration, um, we did have the DCSA stakeholders um, with the, the Deputy Director of DCSA last week. So we're looking for more engagements like that so we can actually engage and not be briefed. Um, so looking for that two-way conversation so we can bring it up what industry's issues are and hopefully how to come up with some solutions of how we can solve those. So thank you um, to all the five CSAs, DOD and DCSA for all the hard work um, this year working together. But I will say, I'm not done. I know you're ready for me to end there. I'm going to point my attention to industry. We have to do better um, speaking uh, as a collective voice. Um, often we're, we're talking in different voices, different priorities, and we are going to have different priorities. But when we're talking at the national level, a legislative level, we have to be able to speak with one voice. I'm speaking from personal experience. After I heard multiple complaints from multiple people, I toned it out. Because when everything's important to industry, nothing's important to industry, and nothing's important to government who's trying to help us resolve that. So we have to do better. We have to lay the foundation to have a strong, united industry front when we are communicating with our government partners. And uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about how industry is going to be represented at those levels and expanding the aperture, aperture a little bit than outside of the uh, industry NISPAC members being more inclusive of the MOU members, but I, I will say for those that come behind me, we need to really clarify and tone up those three priorities, three to five priorities, and, and really concentrate on those. I will say from personal experience, I am employed full time by L3 Harris, but I will say I, I spend about five to six hours every evening to include the weekend really working on, on issues for industry. So um, it, it, it selfless, I will say, when I'm, I'm there, but then my husband says it's just something that I always do. Um, I'm looking for a lot of uh, opportunities when I'm finished with my role um, to uh, spend my time with my family. But I say that because people go into it thinking that it's going to be very easy and things will just flow. It doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of networking, a lot of hard work to get there. So, But I, I will also say that because I encourage you. It's probably the, ben the best time in my life being able to represent industry at this level. I was bamboozled into the position, but I will do it correctly. <laughs> so I, I will say that, and, and most importantly, I, I want to thank everybody again um, for coming together. This was great. Um, lots of networking. This is truly where the work happens. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Heather. Does anyone have any questions for, uh, for Heather? All right. Hearing none, I'm going to turn to uh, Jeff Spinager the Director for Critical Technology Protection for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. He will give an update on behalf of DOD and the NISP executive agent, or as the NISP executive agent, I should say. Jeffrey? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Greg, um, everyone. Uh, thank you. It's good to be here uh, with you in person. God, that is loud. Um, I'm particularly uh, excited for the opportunity to really sit next to Greg. Um, so we were chatting just before, and uh, he noted uh, that he's been present for more than half of all of the 68 NISPACs that there have been. That's a lot. Um, I, I think it maybe gives a little bit more characterization to the level of uh, effort and support that, uh, that Greg uh, you know, has represented on behalf of the NISPAC. And I, I think about this sort of thing a lot. Uh, longevity, we've relied on a very small number of people for a lo very long period of time to really be sh uh, stewards of the, the National Industrial Security Program. And those folks have decided that there are other things that they would like to do in their lives. And so echoing a little bit of what Heather said and noting, but also noting the importance, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is an important forum, this is an important, uh, these are important roles and um, hopefully there are folks out here who have interest in them. 
Um, I'll also, uh, Greg stole my thunder in the first talking point I had, which was the subject regarding, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the maybe revisiting the number of public meetings that we have a year. I completely understand the challenges. Uh, one, pandemic challenges, um, uh, staffing challenges, and the like. Um, but noting again what Heather said uh, and, and everything that's playing out right here, the fact that we were able to leverage this forum. Uh, you know, for the purposes of this public meeting uh, is kind of a backdoor way to public engagement, but it works and it's very, very important. Uh, it's important for all of the, the official reasons. It's more important for, um, I, I remember the breaks in that wonderfully uh, historic auditorium uh, in the archives and we have a break in the middle, which I know we don't have a break this time and I have two cups of coffee in front of me, so. Um, so um, oh, okay, good. All right. All right, excellent. That's really good. So, um, but the uh, but the importance of uh, it's the dialogues that take place right in and around uh, the public setting that are important. And it's uh, and I wrote here transparency and public discourse. Uh, they are absolutely vital uh, to the work that we do to the integration of public policy, uh, you know, industry engagement, and actual the products, right, the work on the other end. So. Uh, thank you for that update, and uh, please let us know what we can do and, uh, and to continue to kind of keep a drumbeat on this um, um, because I think it's quite important. Um, uh, next, uh, as a function of the policy, and, and again, echoing some of the comments that Heather made before, right, so uh, I appreciate very much and, uh, that, uh, that she's read it more than once. I imagine many of you have uh, done the same. Uh, it's, it's not easy to read. It's uh, not super fun to write. Um, and so, but nonetheless, we're pretty happy with uh, where we are. The feedback that, that we've received so far, and, and really, again, thank you to DCSA, you know, and its at, you know, primary outward facing role here to, to, to be a facilitator, to bring information back, to make these documents as living as they can possibly be. Uh, that is important. Um, you know, it's, uh, we, we celebrated the fact that we got the rule out there, and, and about a minute and a half later, we began the First Amendment. Um, it was more, more like a week, um, but not much more than that, right? And we, we did. We established an amendment uh, regarding reporting and pre-approval of foreign travel associated with seed three. Um, that will, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the timeline was extended to August of this year. Uh, we have no cha uh, changes or requirements that we're aware of uh, for any further uh, uh, extensions or amendments to that effect. Uh, I'm very certain that uh, that, uh, that uh, our overseers in rulemaking would take a dim view on any notion of that, and so you'll hear more about that uh, in the update uh, that uh, Keith Menard uh, or, and others will provide uh, here later in the, in the meeting. Uh, but we're not done there, right? So we got the first one done, uh, so we're on the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is largely oriented around public comments that were received uh, during, uh, you know, during um, the, the, uh, the issuance process. Um, we are uh, at a stage now where uh, we do what's called DOD-wide uh, coordination, right? So the, the DOD is a, a giant, uh, uh, you know, uh, federation of components, right, the services and others. Uh, we will work through that process, um, take some time. Uh, stakeholders kind of vary, right? So some of the, you know, the uh, larger companies, but smaller, co uh, smaller, excuse me, components, Small components that would, uh, that have uh, interest. So we will go through that process, and then uh, we'll repeat that on a federal scale. So uh, the, the process moves forward again with an eye for transparency. Uh, we use this forum to provide updates for those pieces that are not, uh, you know, in the public space. And of course, as it moves forward uh, and becomes public as well. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, kind of continue um, to, uh, to provide updates on, uh, on uh, you know, sort of a, an obvious one, but the importance of cybersecurity within the framework of the NISPOM. Um, you know, uh, we haven't yet found a seamless and a repeatable process for industry direct use of cloud, classified cloud, uh, but we're continuing to coordinate with our partners at DIS and DCSA. And um, although I, I would be, I, I, I would, I, I want to say I'm not happy with where we are. Uh, we are making progress. And again, in a, a nod to this is a public discussion, right? So I'm not a big forecast person. I've said that in prior meetings. Um, but I think it's important that we kind of shine a light on ourselves here on what is, uh, you know, in, in many respects, maybe the most, um, uh, it's the under, most underviewed and our, I would, I think, make a pretty strong case, um, um, uh, you know, for uh, it, that it's uh, maybe the most important aspect of what we do right now, right? So um, um, 
And so to that, uh, at the last NISPAC meeting in October, public meeting in October, I reported that a project that uh, my office sponsored at the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security, or ARLIS, um, led to the development of a, what we call a vendor neutral playbook aligned to DISA and DCSA's current process guides, um, including wiring network connection process, security requirements, et cetera, um, uh, you know, that are intended to lead to authorizations to operate. Uh, I also described that through uh, the process of developing this playbook and observation of several pilot efforts, uh, we uncovered a number of challenges that make the, pos the process possible, although um, ar ar arduous doesn't, I think, quite capture the, uh, the challenges at, at this time. Uh, our list uh, made a series of recommendations and requirements. Uh, you know, they framed those, they wrote them all down, which is super helpful. Uh, and then we put them out, uh, you know, and asked uh, NISPAC to, to, uh, to, to review those in earnest. And, and again, uh, you know, with, with some echoing of what, what Heather uh, mentioned before, I, I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, thank Heather uh, and, and all of the NISPAC uh, industry members, uh, you know, for taking the time to go through in, you know, in, in, in really quite agonizing detail uh, the, the, uh, to, uh, to provide meaningful feedback uh, in the work that we asked, uh, you know, our, our list to, uh, you know, sort of as a third-party broker uh, put together. Uh, we look forward to getting this and DCSA kind of in the room on that, uh, understanding that that's the process won't end when we digest all that. It actually will we'll, we'll um, uh, move forward. So I, I, I will end up by saying I have more updates to provide on this. But again, by bringing it forward in this way, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be able to, uh, you know, hold ourselves to a timeline uh, and, and, and get over the line on what, uh, what I think is an important issue. And we do this right, uh, you know, the number of ATOs, which number in the thousands uh, and, and really in the tens of thousands when you aggregate across all of the, the, uh, the, the stakeholders that are out there, DCSA and others, um, I, I don't know, that it seems like maybe you wanted to. And, and so um, there's a better way, I'm convinced of it. Um, uh, finally, uh, two other uh, topics really uh, briefly, and um, I'll, I'll stop, um, Mr. Chair, and that is, uh, so the department continues to make progress, right? I know folks in the audience are paying attention to requirements uh, that, uh, that were levied under um, NDAA 847, FY20 NDAA, regarding foreign ownership control and influence assessments uh, that are DIB-wide. Right. They are largely predicated and intended to be designed on, on, uh, on, on the way in which it's uh, undertaken today, steady state, and for a long time uh, under the Industrial Security Program. But they're broader. There are two pieces that are, are, are of key importance to us, and we want to get it right. Uh, and, that, and that is, uh, one, uh, as a function of award, and two, uh, for all contracts greater than $5 million, including subcontracts. That's a pretty tall order. Um, uh, you know, and so some of the scale that's laid out there run, you know, just in, 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 uh, in, in drastically high numbers. Not a tremendous amount of accuracy in those, right, in, in that speculation. But what is, uh, and so instead of starting big and working to small, since so big is very undefined, uh, you know, again, with some really great uh, partnership uh, from, from DCSA and, and, and in particular Keith Minard, who I, uh, I want to I call out publicly, uh, we've uh, kind of worked out from up. We know what works. We know what are we know what's familiar uh, as it relates to FOCI requirements in the industrial security program. There's language in the statute that encourages us, or frankly, directs us to kind of build out from that same model, and we're building out from there. Uh, with that in mind, uh, again, all roads start with policy. So uh, we're at the issuance uh, point where uh, we hand it over to. Um, we've gotten through all of the editors across the the, the department. Um, Good feedback, mostly. Um, so, uh, and now we're off to uh, off to the lawyers. Uh, the lawyers understand the urgency on this one. We put some heat on ourselves here. Uh, we can create some accountability when we tell the deputy something, the deputy secretary something's important. Uh, and so, um, we are on target, I believe, for an end of FY uh, issuance. Which, uh, so hopefully, I'll have a more firm update, you know, and you'll have something to see that's actually out by, by the time we meet again. Um, but that's not, again, just like anything else, that's not where the process ends. It's really where it begins. Uh, there's a whole mountain of work uh, on that, that, that uh, is certainly levied on DCSA uh, and then to move forward with industry. So we want you to be aware. We want industry to be aware. We want the NISPAC uh, to be aware uh, of this uh, as, it, as it continues to move forward. But we don't need action at this time. Uh, we, we need to, uh, to get over the line on the policy. Uh, where industry uh, and this pack will come into play, we know there's a rule that will be required here. There'll be a DFAR clause that will have to come out the other end, uh, and uh, that will be informed by the policy. 
not by this, I mean, certainly everything underpinned by the statute, but if you know how this stuff works, right, we'll build the DFAR requirements off what's first uh, published in the, in the department's issuance. And finally, uh, our, our last topic today, we'd like to bring up again an ongoing issue regarding joint ventures uh, and FCL requirements. Uh, there was a provision, or there's a provision in FY22 uh, NDAA, um, um, Section 16.9 states if both entities that form a JV are cleared, the JV company itself does not require a facility clearance. To address uh, Section 16.29 language, uh, DOD is intending to publish a directive type memorandum to provide guidance on joint ventures um, that have been awarded DOD classified contracts. There's also a sim there's similar language in um, uh, Small Business Administration Federal Rule uh, published in late 2020 that we believe must be addressed in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in this regulation and guidance, right? So similar is, uh, is a wonderful term, but similar is not the same, which means it's open to a, a, a just a mountain of interpretation, uh, and that's sand in the gears, uh, to put it bluntly. And uh, so the Air Force has encountered and confronted this head on, and uh, so with that, I'd like to briefly turn over uh, to Ms. Jennifer Aquinas uh, for, uh, for some input. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to comment on this issue. Uh, the DOD issues contracts to joint ventures frequently, so questions about this frequent, uh, frequently come up. The Air Force was the first contracting activity to encounter this issue, and we successfully worked through an exception to policy process. That cleared the way, and we were able to issue a classified contract to an unclear joint venture and allow performance on a contract without a facility clearance. But the regulatory conflict uh, remains between the small business agency and the NIST, and until this is resolved, there will be continued confusion. We're concerned about contract po protests and impact to mission and cost. At the last uh, NISPAC meeting in October of 21, I used to advise that the small business rule was not intended uh, to remove the facility clearance requirement. At that time, I used to committed to issuing a notice to apply the conflict and I am with an update from IC today. Thank you, Jennifer, uh, for that. And again, I'll end by saying, uh, and, and just using this last issue as, as, a, as a really great example, uh, you know, this is a, a nod to the utility of the public forum, right, to put this out there in this way, create some accountability in the process. No one's running around with their hair on fire, and we're able to stay in front of what frequently ends up as a litigation matter. And that's, that's really what our end state here is. We're trying to do, uh, you know, the, everyone's trying to do the right thing here, but we see the world where we sit on it, and this is an example uh, as to where, uh, you know, those different worldviews can collide uh, with unintended outcomes. And so uh, with that, um, you know, Greg and, uh, and, uh, and then this back to uh, Team 1, thank you very much for your continued attention on these issues. Uh, thanks for working out the technology wizardry. I have the word technology in my title, and it's a lie. Um, I, I, I'm glad that Jennifer's here because I'm not the only one without a computer on the, in front of them. But the, um, but the, uh, you know, the, to be able to put this together and to be able to shine a public light on these kinds of issues uh, is, uh, is, is important for all of us regardless of where we sit. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Jeff? Mark, this is uh, Greg Pinodia. Yeah, Greg. Yes. It's, it's on now. Sorry about that. Um, it's just a good time to mention the uh, follow-up that ISU is involved in with this uh, issue of joint ventures and clearing the entity, if in fact it is an entity. Uh, I'm told by our attorneys some joint ventures can be created by contract and therefore technically are not a legal entity. In any event, I don't want to spend time here getting into the details. We are still working on an ISU notice that will clarify things. The attorneys have assured us they've spoken to SBA and it was not their intention that we would not vet a joint venture legal entity. Uh, you heard this morning from the speaker about what are the methodologies that he's most concerned about is creating entities by some of our adversaries for illicit purposes. So we hope to have this done in short order. Um, to clarify things, because admittedly, the SBA rule is a bit uh, interpretive, as I'll, I'll say, with like, like a lot of government regs are, but we, we are going to get this thing fixed so that it's clear to everyone. Any questions? Okay, okay back to you, Mark. Okay, thanks, Greg. 
I will now hear from Mr. Keith Minard, Senior Policy Advisor with the Industrial Security Director of the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Keith, over to you. There we go. Does this work now? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Keith Minard, DCSA. Yeah. Let me start off uh, with thanking Greg Pannoni for his support to the NISPAC, industry and government members, as well as the entire NIST community. The staff at DCSA would like to congratulate you on your retirement and good luck. I have a couple key updates this morning uh, on leadership. Um, we've got a new deputy director at DCSA, Mr. Daniel Lecce, and a new industrial security director uh, lead, Mr. Matthew Redding. Um, both are here at the event. I'm sure you've talked to them many times, or you will talk to them before the event's over. Um, well, I get to represent the NISPAC from a DCSA perspective um, as the primary member. Um, I do have to say that it takes a large team of action officers at DCSA to make what happens happen for the NISPAC and take on the issues and challenges that come up to look at resolution and actually work forward to make better processes and practice. So um, it's just not those on the table up here, but a large workforce that's on the back end making these things happen. So um, on, on the first thing, DCSA is back to on-site assessments. Um, so you should see our, our personnel out in the field, on site, doing your security reviews. And uh, that's kind of a big change for us coming from the last couple of years of continuous monitoring events. So Heather talked about this, uh, the NISPAC AAR year in review, I like to call it, from last year. Last fall, after we worked through implementing the NISPOM rule, we thought about asking NISPAC industry for, I'll call it a scorecard or an AAR for FY21. And we've got that scorecard, and we're working through it now. And uh, we're working through all our action officers to look at the things that we can change, things that we can improve, and look at the best practices that came out of last year's implementation of the NISPOM rule. Uh, it, was a great, it was a great time to, to evaluate ourselves in, on how we do business with industry, communicate, and engage. Uh, this was the first time we've had a major event like this since 2016, an insider threat. And what's interesting is actually Heather Sims and myself rolled out insider threat in 2016. In fact, that change came out at an NDI event the, the week we were in Scottsdale. So uh, we're in, we're in uh, NDI now, so these things keep going around and circling. So um, we do like to thank NISPAC industry on providing that input, and we see it as a best practice. And it will continue on next year, so next fall we'll ask for the same product. So I think one of the biggest things that industry is asking about is, uh, we'll talk about that one of the last components of the NISPOM rule implementation for, for DOD, uh, clear contractors under DOD cognizance. And that's the C3 reporting for foreign travel. Uh, as uh, Mr. Spinnager said, the amendment to 32 CFR Part 117 deferred the reporting of C3 foreign travel requirements for 18 months from the issue in state. And that, so this will begin in August of this year. So we want to make sure that we have the right capabilities. And part of this was to have the ability for industry to bulk upload foreign travel rather than doing one-by-one -one submissions of foreign travel to try to better enable the reporting requirements and uh, kind of ease some of the strain. So the deferral uh, was put out to enable the development of the bulk tool. We look like we're still on time for June deployment of, of uh, the plan tool for its use in August of this coming year, uh, this summer, okay? We want to make sure that when that comes out and we're ready for this, we want to make sure we have a communication strategy. We want to make sure we have training and awareness products, whatever we need to better enable implementation by cleared industry. I do want to make a couple notes that as we look at foreign travel reporting and the, for the reasons of C3, we will begin in August going forward, okay? We're not going to ask to go backwards, but I will have to note that if you have to fill out an SF-86, all foreign travel has to be reported on that. So you have to keep in mind that C3 forward, 86 is still require the, the period of time re required by the form for submission. Um, to continue on with um, C3 a little bit, um, we've actually saw patterns of requests for frequently asked questions. We revised the C3 uh, reporting questions, FAQs on our website. Um, we refine them based on input from industry and things that we saw that can better enable and communicate how to do things. And along with that, um, we've had staff create an intuitive tool that helps uh, industry walk through the types of contact reporting that's required by C3. It's a kind of a yes, no, helps drive through a thought process to better understand how to report the C3 requirements. And I, got to, I have to say is, is I think the team at DCSA has become somewhat of subject matter experts on C3 in the federal executive branch from all the work that's being done. Industry, certainly, we appreciate the work you're doing. It's very important. As we report things, you know, um, Heather Sims up front here, we, we want to get ahead of the CECD hits by you reporting, and then we can, see, we can match through that, right? 
Um, the last thing I have on tools and resources is, uh, you may have seen it, uh, the NISPOM actually refers to national policy for safeguarding, and one of the key things that came up was security in depth. Um, in the last month or so, we've actually posted a, a video audio short on uh, security in depth. We found those products very useful during the uh, implementation of the rule, six to eight minute videos that are, narr or slides that are narrated for easy use and information updates. So the last thing I have actually is, and I know this is something that keeps coming up is in a, in a larger area, is um, we're, we're working still. Um, you may know that the DOD manual with the NISPOM was actually rescinded at the end of November, so we're working through the other policy actions to, to rescind the former industrial security letters. Um, we've issued new. Uh, there's, and we have a couple more that are coming out. But when, the reason we're rescinding these, and I'll use some examples, you may have noticed as you read through the NISPOM, it talks about certain types of incidents now may occur on unclassified systems, right? Cyber. And the, the, the 2013 ISL in cyber, that was the key point in it. Uh, we were, another example is safeguarding. We now point to national policy for open storage. So the, the former ISLs, there's about 34 of them, will be rescinded, and we move forward with a new batch of ISLs. To give a status, we've got two more that are still in the pipeline. It does take some time to get these out. It's the, up, it's the revision to insider threat. Uh, industry NISPAC has reviewed these uh, ISLs. Um, key point is it talks about your, your program is having a plan, your self-inspection, and implementation of the minimum requirements. We have added the National Insider Threat Task Force Maturity Framework as a reference. And the other is a um, ISL that covers about nine different topics from designated government representative to uh, destruction equipment and things like that. TS accountability, I know that's a major thing. So we've run down our ISLs, we've reduced the amount now, and but we do want to know with, with industry, when you need additional guidance, please work through industry NISPAC to help us understand what's needed to better implement the program. Um, the last thing I have is actually later you'll hear from uh, Ms. Donna McLeod on our DCSA uh, personal security metrics from the working group and Mr. David Scott on our systems authorization uh, updates and metrics. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Anybody have any questions for uh, Keith? All right. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Valerie Kerbin, Policy Chief, Policy and Collaboration Group, Special Security Director, National Counterintelligence and Security Center, Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Valerie, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, um, and hopefully you all can hear me pretty well. Um, it's a great opportunity to always be here and to provide the SECIA update to the community. Um, I do want to echo everybody's congratulations to Greg. It has been a great partnership with you. Um, I've known you for many years, and you've been um, great to work with and wish you lots of good luck in your retirement. Um, and also to echo Heather, it has been um, great the past few years collaborating with NISPAC. Um, we know that sharing information with them has been quite helpful in shaping policy for trust and workforce. We are in this together and we continue to um, work together on our journey. So um, I also like to take the opportunity to update you on SECIA policies and some trust of workforce things that have been issued. So really since the last time we met in, um, I think, October, um, a few things have been signed, real signature accomplishments. Um, we had a Transforming Federal Personnel Vetting Cabinet Memorandum. It was signed by the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. So it's really the Biden administration's um, endorsement for us to take bold action across the government to transform and sustain a trusted federal workforce. So the guidance in this um, memorandum asked departments and agencies to prioritize and implement trusted workforce. It also asked agencies to designate senior implementation officials who will be accountable for the trusted workforce implementation and ensure all the related efforts at their agencies are conducted and, of course, successful. So that was wonderful that this was signed December 14, 2021. So also just recently, we're pleased to announce that we issued three high-level guideline documents. 
So these guideline documents were signed jointly from the OZNI Security Executive Agent and OPM as a Suitability and Credentialing Agent. And these three guidelines really um, describe the outcomes for successful personnel vetting programs. And they align with the principles found in the Federal Personnel Vetting Corps Doctrine that was effective February of 2021. So um, as we go through all these other documents and policy levels, they all build upon each other. So just to describe a little bit about the personnel vetting guidelines, it will be the outcomes associated with investigations, adjudications, and personnel vetting management activities. It's essential for these components to um, work together in your personnel vetting programs to help identify and manage human risk to ensure a trusted workforce. We also issued the Federal Personnel Vetting Performance Management Guidelines, and this will be the overarching strategic direction for conducting performance management. We want to measure, we want to make sure we're doing things effectively and efficiently, and from that we will put out additional standards and strategies um, and targets for the community, but that will be coming um, down the road. And we also issued the Federal Personnel Vetting Engagement Guidelines. This is the outline approach of engagement which is designed to foster trust in the process. We want to allow the government and help the individual to enter into the workforce in a timely manner and help shape a culture of personal accountability and responsibility. So from these three guidelines that were issued this past February, February 10, 2022, we will be coming out with new investigative standards and I'm sure you're going to be hearing more about it from um, Matt Eanes and also my boss, Mark Fraunfelter, about the new vetting scenarios. But we will be changing the current investigative model, and those investigative standards will be issued very shortly, and then we will come out with additional implementation guidance. Um, so. As a result of all the tremendous effort of collaboration and coordination across the IC and with the NISP community, um, the executive branch and industry partners, we know we're all working together in the same direction for successful outcomes and also to improve transparency in our process and have a shared responsibility. So I also want to just note that two other policies, um, one is in place right now, it's called Seed 9. It's not in place, I'm sorry, it's draft. It's the Whistleblower Protection Appellate Review of Retaliation Regarding Security Clearance. So we did go out to the community and it was just um, with OMB, Office of Management and Budget, for formal coordination. So we're just finishing up coordination and adjudication on that. So um, also thank you to those agencies that helped provide us some comments. Um, one other area to explain, and I know um, there's been some information out there already, um, and it's been shared with our NISP community, is the clarifying guidance on marijuana. Um, it's for agencies to use this guidance to help them in adjudication. Um, and the memo outlines adjudicative guidance on the recency of recreational use of marijuana, the use of CBD products, and the investments of marijuana-related business. So a lot of good information is in this memorandum. It was signed and issued by the security executive agent on December 21st, 2021. So hopefully you all have seen that. And um, I also want to thank Keith and his team and um, DCSA. We know you all are working really hard with the implementation of C3. A lot of great work is done on the toolkit and, um, and resources available for the community for implementing 
um, C3. So um, I think that's all I have to update you on. Um, it was just a high level letting you know what was issued, um, and you will be hearing more later. But um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Valerie. That was very informative. Up next is Mr. Rich DeJosserman, Deputy Director of the National Security Services Division at the Department of Homeland Security for their update. Rich, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, first of all, we've been asked to comment on a few items here, some updates uh, regarding NISPOM implementation. Uh, I'm sure most of you know, but some may not be aware that DHS and DOD have a special security agreement uh, we work in tandem with DOD, DCSA. Uh, our industrial security branch continues to work with DCSA and their personnel security teams on the implementation of the NISPOM rule. Uh, we have not had any issues to date. Uh, regarding COVID, uh, during the pandemic, 70% of the DHS workforce uh, continued to work. And on March 27th, the rest of the staff began a modified return to work schedule. Uh, that 30% is mostly on a telework uh, hybrid coming into the office uh, once to twice a week. So that's where we are as of today. Uh, regarding CUI, uh, although CUI has not been adopted, our information security branch continues to participate in the NARA working groups and is working with the intelligence community to plan for implementation once uh, CUI is officially adopted. Uh, Trusted Workforce 2.0, uh, DHS continues the implementation of Trusted Workforce 2.0. To date, DHS has enrolled about 83% of our security population into the ODNI uh, continuous evaluation system, and we are on track for full implementation by FY24. And there was also, Heather had asked us to speak a little bit, our insider threat. Uh, our insider threat and personal security teams are continue uh, to work together to develop policies and SOPs. They are meeting uh, once a month to uh, collaborate with each other, so uh, we are on track for that as well. Um, if there are any questions, that's all I really have. Uh, if there are any questions uh, regarding any of these updates, please submit them, and uh, we will provide inputs there and answers to you uh, as soon as we receive those. So if there's nothing else, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Uh, next date, update we'll hear from is uh, Natasha Sumter, Director, Office of Security, and uh, Eric Person, Officer of the Insider Threat Program, both the Department of Energy. Please take it away. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, my name is Natasha Sumter, and I do work in the Office of security policy at the Department of Energy. And I'm joined today by Mr. Paul Dufresne, who is a part of our Departmental Personnel Security Office, as well as Mr. Eric Person, who will provide the insider threat update. So to begin, thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this discussion today. We absolutely appreciate the partnership and engagement that we have with our industry and government partners within the NIST. So um, thank you. And to Greg, thank you so much for your service. We appreciate your leadership with the NIST PAC, and we look forward to seeing you in your civvies and your umbrella drinks and sitting on the beach somewhere. So uh, best to you in your retirement. So today I'm going to give you uh, just a couple of updates from a departmental, from a DOE departmental perspective. So of course we always have a lot of things going on as a self-regulatory organization. We are constantly reviewing national drivers and the security postures of our other organizations, but also of course within our own department just to ensure that we are aligning with those security policies that have been recently published, updated, et cetera, and to ensure that we are doing the things or doing those, um, exercising those requirements and implementing those practices that make sense for our mission and the security assets that we have within our organization. And to that effort, we have been reviewing 
DOE Order 470.4B, which is the Safeguards and Security Program Order, which handles or actually discusses a lot of the industrial security matters that you would see in the NISPOM or the 32 CFR 2004. So we are currently beginning the process to open that order for a complete rewrite. Yes, I said it, a complete rewrite. We are going to review everything that has ever been issued concerning industrial security matters and ensure that we're doing the right thing, not just for the department and our, our security assets, but also for our stakeholders and our partners within the NIST. So um, regarding the updates that we have been asked to provide, specifically CUI, we have reviewed the national driver, the 32 CFR 2002, and we have implemented that regulation via DOE Order 471.7, which is Controlled Unclassified Information, which was published on February 3rd of this year. And of course, whenever we update our policies, we always collaborate and engage both our partners, our industry partners, and our federal employees and uh, SMEs throughout the department and even across the agency lines. So just so everyone kind of understands the construct of DOE, DOE is a very decentralized organization. So we have all of these different program offices that implement the national drivers, the departmental requirements, et cetera. But whenever there is a requirement that applies to our contractors, those are conveyed through what is called a contractor requirements document. And regarding the 471.7, the CUI order, it does have a contractor requirements document that conveys those requirements to our contractors, which will eventually be updated in updated contracts but also issued with the new contracts that are um, uh, provided to our contractors. So we were asked a few questions concerning uh, CUI implementation or CUI within the department. And one of the questions was regarding oversight from a CSA perspective. Another question was asking about the reporting requirements and mechanisms, but also to clarify um, the definition or the term of unauthorized disclosure. So from an oversight perspective, as I mentioned, that we do have the order that is currently in play, but also we have other governing documents, including DOE Policy 226.2, which is the policy for federal oversight and contractor assurances, um, and DOE Order 226.1b, which is implementation of Department of Energy oversight policy. Those documents provide the oversight structure for both our federal operations and our contractor assurances. And while those documents are published, we do keep them updated and maintained as well. So we also have the, um, we have an Office of Independent Assessment, which provides our oversight um, activities as well. So they do not have any line management or policy making responsibilities or authorities. However, they do provide the oversight of those requirements that are published in the various security related orders for the department. <laughs> Excuse me. So our federal and contractor operations are an integral part of DOE's assurances for our safety and our security programs. And we ensure those documents are updated. We ensure that those assessments are completed or conducted within a timely manner because we have to provide those assurances to not just our senior leadership within the organization, our workers, but also to the public. And of course, you, our contractor partners. So through these independent oversight programs, we enhance our safety and security programs by identifying any concerns or issues that may have arise during an assessment, but also providing corrective actions, 
and a way forward to addressing or mitigating those issues. And that is also included in our CUI order. So another question that we were asked to address was, what are the reporting mechanisms for um, industry issues, lack of marking, handling guidance, et cetera, to our customers? So DOE Order 471.7, contains those reporting requirements um, to the site and program office oversight officials. And in addition to that, we have other reporting requirements to the Office of the Inspector General and that are also and other requirements that align under the order that I mentioned earlier, which is the 470.4B, which is respectively my order. That's the one that I'm responsible for updating. Um, and that order has an incidence of security concern program that is leveraged to identify various issues to include, which will include CUI, reporting requirements, et cetera. And finally, we were asked to provide some feedback on how we define unauthorized disclosure. So 32 CFR 2002, section four, actually has a definition. And the Department of Energy leverages that language to define what it actually means to the department. So the unauthorized disclosure occurs when an authorized holder of CUI intentionally or unintentionally discloses CUI without any lawful government purpose in violation of restrictions imposed by safeguarding or dissemination controls, um, but on the contrary to limited dissemination controls as well. So um, with that said, that is the updates on what's happening in our policy world and some of our policy world, because there's always something going on, but also just to provide some responses to our, um, the questions that were posed regarding CUI. And you will later hear updates from Eric Person regarding the insider threat program and also Mr. Paul Dufresne from our departmental personnel security offices. And barring any additional questions, I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any questions for uh, Ms. Sumter? All right. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Chris Heilig, Chief of the Personal Security Branch, uh, giving the national, uh, I'm sorry, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission update. Chris? Um, good morning. Good I, I morning. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. Speaker at the end or for the clearance working group? Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Chair, this is Dennis Brady. Uh, I've got uh, uh, something prepared for the NRC. Okay, Dennis, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, just cover over the uh, where we are with the COVID uh, return to work. Is the NRC has returned to work in a hybrid work environment with most of the staff in the office minimum of two days a week. Uh, that means on any given day, uh, the number of staff physically in our NRC facilities is just over half of what it was prior to COVID-19. Uh, the agency currently doesn't have any plans to change from this COVID work in, or the hybrid work environment. Uh, seems to be working very well with the staff. Uh, we're able to achieve our mission uh, in providing oversight uh, to the nuclear industry. Uh, for the CUI program, uh, we are on track. Uh, the NRC has their policy statement published and the rule has been approved by our commission that supports the NRC's transition to CUI in September of 2022. Uh, the NRC uh, operates internally under management directives as uh, DOE uses the rules. Um, we uh, have our management directive in place. Uh, training has been uh, all established and it uh, supports both the NRC employees and, and contractor uh, communities. Uh, under C3, our foreign travel report approval uh, tool is uh, been published and, and is active uh, for cleared employees and a large portion of our cleared contractor population. 
The remaining contractor population, which is our cleared licensees, um, will be captured under that program uh, later this year. That was the last element of the seed three requirements that we had to uh, implement. So we're, uh, by the end of this summer, we'll be uh, fully compliant, uh, capturing all the required reporting uh, data and uh, the uh, agency approved C3 foreign travel reporting requirements. Uh, that's the end of my report. I, I don't have any other updates um, from either inside the threat or on the trusted workforce. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Anyone have any questions for, uh, for Dennis? All right, we're next going to turn uh, to Felicia uh, from the uh, chief, who's the chief office of security policy, giving the CIA's update. And then after she talks, we will have a five minute uh, break. Felicia, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Chairman. Um, also, we would like to also echo what everyone else has been saying about Greg. We want to wish you all the best in your retirement, and we want to thank you for all that you have done for NISPAC and for your engagement with industry as well as with the government. And so today I will be making uh, brief statements on behalf of the agency in reference to the NISPOM implementation um, as well as controlled unclassified information, and then give you a brief statement on trusted workforce. Uh, the, after that time, if you have any additional questions, we ask that you submit those questions through the appropriate protocol or as instructed at the beginning of this forum. So in reference to NISPAC implementation, the CIA industry security staff is actively engaging in the implementation of the new NISPOM as a federal rule. We are working closely with our procurement executive to have our contract security clauses amended to reflect the new guidance. We are also hosting a series of industry, industrial workshops designed for company security officers, and the information will be discussed at these upcoming events. As far as guidance regarding the C4 updates, we are incorporating that information into our current policy. And the seed four, as you know, is the National Security Adjudicative Guidelines. Regarding controlled, unclassified information, we are working closely with the ODNI uh, representatives. Once they issue policy guidance, we will begin that implementation. Trusted Workforce 2.0. We are continually actively participating in multiple um, government and uh, government-led working groups focused on providing substantive comments and review of Trusted Workforce 2.0 draft policy. And in those discussions of agency and government-wide capabilities and achieving future Trusted Workforce requirements, our focus at present is in achieving the early 2.0 milestone of full enrollment of agency members in our continuous evaluation program by the 30th September of 2022, as required in the January 2021 Executive Agent Memorandum. As we wait on issuance of accompanying standards, which will define requirements to an operational level, we remain focused on our review and comparison of current vetting processes against the draft 2.0 future standards, so we might plan and project any agency shifts in technology, resources, and processes by the deadline of 2024. We remain mindful that ensuring a trusted workforce within the CIA and throughout the government requires that we all maintain strong and sustaining relationships with our industry partners. As we gain additional operational level details in the soon to be released policy, which will tie us to our industry partners, we will begin a series of conversations to ensure that we will work together to achieve these requirements. We want to thank you for this opportunity and your attentiveness. That's all from us, from the CIA. Thank you so much. Any, uh, does anyone have any questions for Felicia? All right, hearing none, we're going to take a five-minute break. I've got on my watch here 1116, so we get back in five minutes. Uh, we'll next hear from Please Bob Mason. Please do not leave um, the room because we're going to have to start immediately. Okay. So we'll, we'll Five minute break will begin now.
ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Up next is Bob Mason, Alarm System Auditor and UL2050 Subject Matter Expert with Underwriters Laboratory, LLC. Bob, yours. Please Thank you very much, please. Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for this opportunity for you all to speak during this event. Um, we'll all be talking about the National Industrial Security Systems Standard, UL2050. It's the fifth edition. We'll be talking about four types of monitoring. Uh, the first monitoring of the, of the standard is Chapter 6. It's Government Contracting Monitoring Station. It, it, it has the ability, it's a government contractor location. It has the ability to monitor UL2050 certificates within a 244 hour radius from that location. Um, the alarm service company who issues the certificate also has to maintain the, re, uh, the receiving equipment at the monitoring station. So it couldn't be ABC Alarm Inc. maintaining the equipment and not writing the certificates like CBA Alarm um, Inc. is writing the certificate. So it has to be the same alarm company who issues the certificate also maintains the equipment for the receiving equipment for a government contracting monitoring station. And also the government contracting monitoring station is um, maintained by the alarm service company. So they verify compliance for the physical construction of the, uh, of the uh, monitoring station. And they also maintain the alarm receiving equipment they verify fire protection. They make sure there's clocks in, in place, um, primary and secondary power, um, communication circuits, and personal. Those are the key uh, fundamentals of the GCMS. Um, this government contract and monitor station also is required to monitor the alarms, um, opens and closes. Um, it's all uh, the alarms and unauthorized openings dispatching investigators, trouble uh, signals and service calls, and creation of records. A government contracting monitoring station is not able to monitor any UL certificates outside of the four hour, 240 mile radius of the station. Um, a national industrial monitoring station, however, is able to monitor outside that 240 miles and four hour, four hour radius from the station. Um, they are also UL listed for CRZM. So UL does go out and verify compliance on an annual basis at these stations to make sure that for the fundamentals of the, uh, the monitoring station for physical uh, protection, alarm receiving equipment, fire protection, clocks, primary and secondary power, communication circuits, and personnel. Um, these facilities and these monitoring stations are also required to monitor the, of the alarm systems, um, openings and closings, alarms and unauthorized openings, dispatching investigators, trouble signals and service calls, and creation of records. And then the uh, third option for monitoring these types of facility, uh, these types of certificates, is a Sears, um, is a central station, a commercial UL listed central station. They can be listed for um, a UUFX for fire, a CPVX for burglar alarm, or CVSU for residential monitoring. Um, the uh, commercial UL central stations, they follow a UL 827 standard. Um, they're also required to monitor of alarm systems, opens and closes, alarms and unauthorized openings, dispatching investigators, trouble signals and service calls, creation of records. They're also required to monitor the um, uh, physical, UL also verifies compliance with these central stations uh, on an annual basis for the category. Um, so um, these central stations also have to have a DD-254 in place to verify uh, for cleared operators up to the secret level. Um, and then the fourth um, type of monitoring is law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement is um, 
not able to monitor uh, opens and closes. They only can monitor alarms and troubles. Uh, law enforcement also, anytime using law enforcement, it's required to have prior approval on the alarm system description form um, for NISPOM. And um, they, again, I've only seen one, and that was like 10 years ago. I'm not sure of, of an, one that's being operated on as of right now. But those are the four types of monitoring. And if I get invited again to speak at another event in the future, I'd like to talk about the four types of investigating. Um, the other thing I'd like to also talk about is the four of uh, the two proposals that were sent out a couple of years ago. Uh, one is automation systems, um, automation systems to bring into the new UL 2056 edition. I haven't done this, but these are just proposals that I'm waiting for approval on for, by the by the government. Um, this is for redundancy for Chapter 6, Government Contracting Mining Station, and the National Industrial Mining Station, which is Chapter 7 of the UL 2050 currently. Um, this would allow, like I said, redundancy for any equipment for failure. Um, the intent of the additional paragraphs was the monitoring stations to equip with redundancy, and this will, all, uh, will assure if at any time the computer system were to fail, there is a backup system that will automatically be in place to continue processing of signals. Um, not only for the automation system, but also the, like, the communication circuits, um, whereas like the inter uh, in internet service providers, um, having two internet service providers rather than just one, um, that way if one of the service providers goes down, it would automatically switch over to the secondary internet service provider or or even an MFVN, um, two different MFVNs or a combination of one or the other. So um, that's what I had today. I, was, I heard that we were kind of um, strapped with time, so I was trying to do this as quick as possible, but as clear as possible as well. But that was my presentation. And again, thank you for this opportunity. Oh, you're, you're most welcome. Bob, does anybody have any questions for Bob? Okay, thank you, bud. We thank will now you. hear from the General Services Administration's Chief of Policy Standards and Engineering Branch, Mr. Chris Pollock, who will go over the safe ordering process for industry. Chris? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a thank you to ISOO for giving me the opportunity to give a, a quick update on the GSA safe ordering process um, for the storage containers and vault doors used to protect classified information. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to just hit a couple of highlights of the presentation um, rather than go through it step by step. So, um, I don't know, can we skip to slide number four real quickly? There you go. Uh, so, this is sort of the synopsis of the procurement requirements. Um, first of all, you have to have the requirement to store classified information um, within your contract. Usually, that's in a DD-254. Some other government agencies do use other forms, but primarily that's in the DD-254. Um, you also have to have an activity address code or the uh, associated DODAC. Um, these DODACs or activity address codes are assigned by your government contracting officer, and this is probably the biggest sticking point in placing an order through GSA for the containers. Um, so it's important that you maintain good communication with your contracting officer to make sure you've got the DODAC assigned and that you're using the appropriate one. Um, again, uh, you also have the ability to pay, which is kind of self-explanatory. We do allow payment in all kinds of different methods, including PayPal and the connections to bank accounts or um, different types of credit cards. Uh, and um, so. And this process goes through, this, this presentation goes through both the online and offline ordering of GSA containers. Primarily for this audience, that would be the offline uh, process, which includes filling out of the, 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 uh, the form 1348. Um, one, just, yeah, just one more quick comment about the process, then I'll address a couple of other uh, specific questions. But. Um, yeah, um, through COVID, we found that it is absolutely critical that in, when you're placing an order in the remarks section to provide a good point of contact. Um, throughout COVID, with different uh, rules regarding uh, building opening and handling of material and the whole 
process uh, potentially getting uh, changed, it's critical that they have a point that our manufacturers have a point of contact to be able to, to work through any issues that arise. Um, so again, uh, that's real quick. Uh, again, these, these slides that will be presented um, go through it in pretty good detail. But if you have any questions regarding the process, uh, send them to uh, again NISPAC at NAR.gov. Uh, happy to address any questions. Um, we do have a, have heard a couple of questions regarding some specific issues. Um, the first of those is the cost of the GSA approved containers. Um, I'm kind of probably preaching to the choir a little bit here and talking to the industry partners, but um, we have seen uh, some sort of unprecedented changes in the cost of steel over the last couple of years. Uh, depending on which index you look at, the, the cost of steel is up about 200% since March of 2020. Um, we've also been affected by the shortage of electronic components. Um, that's caused some redesign and retesting um, additional costs for our lock. Um, overall, this has resulted in about a 30 to 40% increase in the cost of our GSA approved containers. Um, yeah, um, not, not where we want to be, and we are keeping track of those indicators to see if at some point in the future we can reduce the cost. Um, but right now we're looking at, a, again, a 30 to 40 percent increase over the last two years of the cost. Um, delivery, uh, yeah, during COVID, um, delivery was affected uh, for sure. Um, our manufacturers had the same issues that uh, most of the rest of the world had regarding uh, staffing shortages, particularly uh, welders, machinists, painters. Um, GSA tries to maintain a 30 to 45 day uh, delivery time. That's what's in our contracts. During COVID, that time slipped, sometimes as far as 90 days, but we are working to get back to the 30 to 40 day, 45 days. Um, most of our manufacturers are meeting that on a pretty consistent basis. Um, but yes, some of the deliveries over the last couple of years have been delayed. Um, the final comment I have is uh, with regard to ISO Notice 2021-01, which is uh, the um, removal of the black label or older containers from service. Um, I understand that there's been um, quite a bit, uh, well, a little bit of confusion regarding trying to identify the containers and um, that need to be replaced. The best place, the best resource to find out information about that is the DOD Lock Program Technical Support Hotline. That's available to both DOD government and, and industry um, uh, as a resource. And I would um, ask ISU if they could um, include the, the web page and the inf information for the DOD Lock Program in, in the minutes to the meeting. And that's all I have. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, you're most welcome, Chris. All right, um, we're now moving into the portion of the meeting where we get reports from the NISPAC working groups. However, we will not be discussing all of them. We will, we have provided slides with highlights of them all. All right, we will only be discussing the clearance and NIST information systems authorization, also known as NISA working groups at this time. Um, Greg, if you would take that part away, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, and for those of you who don't know, we've had these two working groups, the NISA and the Clearest Working Groups. These have been standing working groups um, for probably 15 years. I believe it was Tom Langer and another industry rep who I can't recall who uh, came to ISOO at the time when the clearance processing was off the charts and similar issues with the uh, information systems authorizations. And it was right around the time I think IRPA was coming out too, as far as uh, timeline requirements. And anyway, I think we made a lot of progress by putting focus on it. Um, and we've continued to have these groups and you know, there's been some ebb and flow. I think right now we're at a pretty good state with uh, the timeliness, at least of the personal security clearances. Um, so our working group, the clearance working group, we, we generally meet at least once between NISPAC meetings and some of the things you've already heard have been discussed at those meetings. Uh, one thing I don't think we've mentioned is uh, the SF-312 non-disclosure agreement. One of the things coming out of COVID that we heard from a few agencies 
was the re there's the requirement to have a wet signature on the form, and uh, that was deliberate. The Department of Justice, when we uh, updated or the initial regulation for the 30, uh, the EO 13526, 32 CFR Part 2001, they wanted that in there for legal purposes. Anyway, technology's advanced. Um, we have meaningful ways uh, using cryptography technology uh, to enable the use of a digital signature. We coordinated with ODI, and i who essentially owns the form, uh, as well as the Department of Justice. And I'm pleased to say that effective May 9th, uh, the directive language will be uh, effective. It, it's been amended, and it will allow for the use of a digital signature as long as you're using cryptography technology that in a meaningful way can ensure authenticity. So that said, what we're referring to is either the use of the CAC card or the uh, PIV card along with a, uh, a PIN number, uh, so government-issued uh, cards, those two cards for now. And if an agency can demonstrate another card, then that's fine too. And we, the way the wording of the directive, it, it's left up to the agency if they want to deploy this. Now, I will say we'll be putting out an ISOO notice uh, on or about May 9th, the effective date, uh, simply because, uh, unfortunately, it will not actually be able to be operationalized in all likelihood on that date because ODI and I uh, has informed us it's very unlikely they will have the changes to the form made. There are some changes obviously needed because with a digital signature, you will no longer need a witness, for example. So anyway, uh, some progress there. Um, let's see, a couple other things. Um, mentioned in the past, ISU. We've been undergoing uh, reform in the way we collect data. We collect a lot of data, it's true, uh, to the point that sometimes agencies uh, complain a little bit because we have so many reporting requirements. We do, after all, have to report annually to the president each year, so we're not just making this stuff up ourselves. There's requirements that we have by way of executive order to do this. Anyway, through that process, one of the things we've been looking at, besides the overall data reform initiative, for collecting information uh, is cost. And as it relates to NISP, uh, there are requirements in the two executive orders, the one for the NISP and the one for the CNSI classified program, and that concern cost. And they, those requirements cascade down into the directives, the applicable directives. So we've been meeting just government only to discuss a way forward to get better estimates of the cost of entities under the NISP ICSA um, that cost to implement the NIST. So in other words, think if we didn't have a NIST, those costs wouldn't exist because those requirements wouldn't exist. Um, so we, we are at a point where DOD, our colleagues at DOD, put forward a, uh, an outline that captures like the major buckets of cost and does it in a way, we believe, that will impact industry the least. So we're coordinating that with the other CSAs and we're planning to meet next week. And just to give you a little flavor of what we're talking about in terms of the buckets, so security and labor, right? Every, every entity has to have a facility security officer. Uh, depending on your facility, you have ISSMs and, and other individuals that uh, document custodians and what have you. Um, there's obviously then there's the investigations, there's the adjudications and uh, continuous vetting. And these, these are things that we think, we the government, and we'll share these with industry once it's ready to be shared. We can get the, these data without really bothering you. In other words, we should be able to get that on our own. And there's a few other things we're looking at. Information systems technology that process classified information, what additional costs are there, because it's, you're processing classified information, perhaps physical security aspects, um, and then training, right? I think the training we can also get on our own by using some extrapolation of the number of cleared people <coughs> times X amount of hours per year times uh, a rough dollar figure per hour, hour of salary, you know, pay to get to those things. So we're hopeful to get that, uh, and that'll give us a better 
estimate of the cost on the, in, and I know there's some debate about it's ultimately government's paying for it, but the way the wording in the directive and the orders are written, this would give us a better way to come up with estimated costs to implement the requirements, the main requirements of, of having a NISP. So uh, that's a good thing, I think. Uh, another thing, um, uh, I'm not sure if Heather brought it up, but uh, during our clearance working group, it was discussed, and I've heard it in other forums, like the DCSA stakeholders meeting for industry. But let's be honest, apparently from what I'm hearing, we have uh, a concern right now with the processing times for facility security clearances um, and the rejection rate as well. So um, what I'm recommending, we've done this before with other parts of the program, is to form a small ad hoc working group, and I'm asking this of our chair, um, to, to focus on what are the issues, what are the major impediments that are causing this rejection rate. So, you know, we can analyze this, I can hopefully rather quickly study it, see what's going on. Is it the foci aspects of clearing the entity or what other aspects are going on there? So I'm hoping that we can, we can do that. So I, I'm going to stop right there. And uh, if there's any questions from NISPAC members, you can take them. Hey, Greg, uh, Heather from industry. Um, you knew I'd have a couple questions just to go back. Um, you, you talked about funding the NISP is inherently a government responsibility. Many of us are aware that there's a lot of unfunded requirements that come out, and so that's why it's ever more important to understand when the five CSAs or anybody that touches industry understands when you add a requirement that is not policy or contractually required, that it's so important to consider that industry is paying out of pocket sometimes for those. But I need to remind industry, if we do get an unfunded requirement or a new process change after the contract has been awarded, you can go back to your government customer and renegotiate that contract. Very important to make sure you're that your company is not um, eating all those costs. And I'm going to take it back to the JPAS to DIS transition and the DIS to NBIS transition. Industry did eat a lot of that, um, that money and resources when we corrected that data, so that's very important to make sure something that um, very minute really adds to the cost of doing business with the government in this space, so very important to make sure we do that. But getting back also to the facility clearance process, uh, you talked about um, uh, having that small group um, to work on, the ad hoc group to work on the improvements of the process, the 60% rejection rate, but also the IT portion of that where if you have a simple change to make, you have to start, start that process all over again also adds to the time of trying to get somebody sponsored. But I'll also add that with, without a good foundation in that facility clearance or vet, um, entity vetting process, um, with um, the 845 or 847 coming forward, um, we want to ensure it from the industry's perspective, is that going to be the same bodies at DCSA doing the same process that's going to be doing the FCL and FOCI um, vetting process? Because if it is, we need to ensure that um, DCSA has the resources to properly do that because otherwise in industry we're going to see some supply chain issues with bringing in subcontractors to do um, some of our um, contract needs. Thank you. Well, if there's no other questions, I think the way we've got this set up is DCSA is going to provide some systems metrics next uh, and followed by DOE and NRC. Yeah, that's right, Greg. We're going to hear now from uh, David Scott with DCSA for DCSA's Information Systems Update. David? Yes, thank you. Um, since the last NISPAC, uh, just give a brief update. We've uh, realigned regions from an AO perspective. Yeah. I wanted to announce the regional AOs and which region they align to. Mid-Atlantic region is Mr. Ezekiel Marshall, formerly the Capital Region. Eastern region, we have a brand new um, AO that's come on board since the last NISPAC, Alexander Hubert. Central region, William Bond. Western region, Stacey Omo. Those are your regional AOs uh, that if industry has questions or concerns to work through the regions uh, all the way up to, to NAO as, uh, as needed. Um, next slide. Uh, uh, I just want to uh, really just kind of um, uh, explain our, our partnership with the NISA Working Group has been very instrumental, um, working through some major uh, 
challenges over the last uh, few months where industry has requested more insight into metrics. And uh, uh, in December, we had a process where DITSA could uh, work to change a workflow, package workflow. For us. And due to our strong relationship with the NISA working group, we were able to collaborate, communicate um, effectively to make a change in January that was, uh, I, I think, monumental. And uh, that change happened in January with zero downtime and industry was fully engaged. And it really is already starting to prove uh, positive value because industry has now direct insight to where their package is throughout the assessment and authorization process. So we've heard nothing but positive impact there, and we're looking to build upon that on many other um, enhancements within EMAS for industry and for us uh, internally. Uh, currently, we're still going to be trending and baselining our metrics, and we'll, at the next, next NISPAC, I'll be able to provide more insight to include DCSA time. One uh, kind of late-breaking thing that I'd like to bring up to, uh, to uh, the, the community here is um, we've had some uh, uh, concerns with access to EMAS uh, computer-based training, um, which is now hosted in the uh, RMF Knowledge uh, Service, and there's been access issues from industry. Um, just want to report that we have been working with DISA, and we've recently got approval to host in the STEP environment from CDSE. And we are working that um, actually right now. And as soon as that uh, we get approval uh, to, to hit the live system go, we will work with the NISA working group to publicize that. And uh, on the, another positive engagement that we've had with the uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, the next, uh, another positive engagement that I'm happy to report is uh, with the NIST Connection Process Guide. Um, with, with this guide is instrumental providing a uh, hands-on process flow for um, any contract requirement to interconnect with a system within the NISP. This is something that I think is much needed, and uh, due to the collaboration with the NISP, uh, uh, the NISA Working Group, we received a lot of feedback um, over the course of the last three months, and now we are looking to formally uh, publish that uh, through, through the processes of the Federal Registry. So that is where we're at with that. We've moved forward with the NISA Working Group, and we're looking forward to um, a coordination there. And then lastly, where are we going next um, from an NAO perspective? Uh, we're going to continue EMAS. Uh, updates and job aids, and we're going to utilize EMAS as their help desk uh, page to put information out to industry as fast as possible to all 4,000 users. So please pay attention to EMAS and that front page for any guidance, job aids, um, to, to really make, make the job easier. We're also working internally right now on an update to overall <coughs> DAPM uh, 3.0, and we're going to partner with the NISA Working Group uh, for that as well uh, to, to really close up any gaps in processes and procedures that industry sees and that we also see. And then lastly, um, uh, Command Cyber Readies Inspections, the last report uh, was that I provided at the NISPAC that we were planning to go out and start executing CCRIs. We've actually already executed one, and we're already uh, planning for the rest of the FY to conduct uh, many more, and then also our FY23 planning for our approved CIPRANET notes. And uh, we're going to continue to partner with the NISA Working Group as our, as our primary uh, working group for uh, information exchange and collaboration to, to improve our process procedures. And that's all I've got pending questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. We're now going to hear from Donna McLeod with DCSA uh, for their vetting statistics. Thank you. Thank you. This is Donna McLeod from the Background Investigation Program. And today I will be providing the metrics for uh, personnel security with DCSA. And that will include the vetting risk operations, VRO, our background investigations and adjudication. So to start with uh, VRO, vetting risk operations, the investigation, submission and interim uh, industry populations at uh, approximately a million. And FY22 investigation uh, request submissions about 100,000. 90% of all initial investigation had an interim determination made on average within five to seven days. Please remember to submit your fingerprints for initial clearance prior to submitting an investigation request. You cannot open an investigation or issue an interim determination without required fingerprint results. In um, FY22, we triage approximately 8,000 um, incident reports. Under the continued vetting, DCSA is responsible, responsible for implementation of DOD CV program. Currently, approximately 975,000 industry subjects are currently enrolled in CV and with 156,000 PRs deferred to date. As of January 22, all PRs submitted to VRO will be deferred into CV. 
we reached full enrollment of DOD clear population into a trusted workforce CD compliant program in FY21. And we continue to work to, set, to a steady state of new enrollments moving forward. For our CB alert management, post CB enrollment alerts are generated based on established thresholds, which aligns with federal investigative standards and adjudicative guidelines. Currently, we average approximately 6 percent I mean, alert rate. Um, criminal and financial are the most common value, um, valid actionable alerts that we receive. And FY22, we received 19,000 industry alerts, of which 8,000 were not previously known information, which equates to 41%. On to the background investigation. Our total inventory for background investigation continues to remain within a stable state. Q2 started and ended at approximately 171,000 cases, and we fluctuate between 166 to 174 throughout the quarter. Um, with the current level also is, is at 171,000 cases. For industry cases and Q2 that we have in between uh, 27.6 thousand cases, one, which represent a 1.5 thousand um, decrease from our Q2 start, and currently 26,000 cases. Much of this decrease is due to the PR uh, decrease numbers that are coming in. And Q2 industry announced that they will no longer be submitting PRs, PR investigations and have shifted towards the continuous vetting. Prior to Q2, we received 8 to 10,000 industry PRs per quarter, and during Q2s, we received uh, just 600 cases. So you can see the decrease. Um, in regards to the BI timeliness for industry, remember these metrics are based on end to end meaning the cases that have gone all the way through the process to adjudication for that particular quarter. So um, in FY22 for Q2, our T5 end to end timeliness is at 155 days. That is 30 days for initiation, 108 days for investigation, and 17 days for adjudication. Our T3 initials for the same time period, end to end timeliness is shown at 117 days. 32 days for initiation, 68 days for investigation, and 17 days for adjudication. This is a big improvement over where we were two years ago. When you look at the T5 end to end timeliness numbers, we were at 221 days. And then our T3 end to end timeliness was at 132 days. Um, timeliness has been trending upward due to uh, multiple reasons within the organization. We have an increase in processing time for our security and suitability and investigation index files, known as our SII files. Um, analysis was conducted and it shows a direct correlation between this and the increase in timeliness, particular to our T5. Additional, additional staff has been assigned to continue working down the inventory of the SII files. We also experienced a valid printer issue in our business facility which resulted in 150,000 150, vouchers being delayed on over 41,000 cases, and it was largely impacting the C3 timeline. Co um, COVID impact to the background investigation. COVID restrictions beginning to ease across the country were likely to experience a reduction in number of cases that are being held due to COVID. In the past eight weeks, our COVID health cases have dropped by 85% and now stands at only 420 cases. But the investigative clock does not stop due to COVID and it does impact the investigative timeliness. Over the past two years, DCSA employees have adapted and remained flexible and just demonstrated agility to continue meeting mission requirements. Um, since last summer, we successfully um, sustained operations through significant surges due to COVID and constantly adapting to um, close all COVID-impacted cases as quickly as possible. On to our adjudication program as a whole, adjudication is meeting timeliness goals as set by Congress, Office of Management and Budget, and the Director of National Intelligence. For our industry adjudication portfolio, we are largely meeting timeliness goals with a few exceptions. In FY22 Q2, our initial adjudication timeliness was 17 days for T3 and Tier 5 investigations, and 33 and 28 days for T3R and our T5R respectively. 
We are forecasting initial adjudicative timeliness to remain in compliance with congressional mandates. For periodic reinvestigations, we expect timeliness performance to continue to remain close to or above OMB's target of 30 days. Um, adjudications completed over 95.2 thousand in national security adjudications, which include incident reports, customer service requests, continuous vetting products, comprise more than half of the denial and revocation information sources. The top three reasons personnel are being denied or revoked remain financial considerations, criminal conduct, and personal conduct. Coupled with meeting timeliness requirements, adjudications continue to execute national security adjudication decision with high, high level quality, delivering 100% appropriate determination rate on all adjudication in support of our customers. Our current industry inventory is at 19.4 and it complies of uh, customer service requests, incident reports, tiered investigation, and continuous vetting alerts. Um, the industry inventory has been relatively steady for the last four quarters, um, and we closed approximately 94,000 cases this year. Um, on behalf of the Personnel Security Mission Space for DCSA, thanks again for your partnership as we move forward in Trust the Workforce Transforma Transformation Initiatives. We remain, we remain focused on preparing for the Invis and Trust the Workforce implementation. To this end, we are working collaboratively with our um, partners and embers, our uh, customer agencies, our industry partners, to continuously improve our focus on our customer service and support operational needs. And that concludes my part of the overview. Thank you, Donna. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Paul Dufresne, Personal Security Field Assistance Program Manager, Department of Energy, to give us his metrics. Paul. Good day, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide you this information. Uh, as you can see, over a quarterly trend, uh, the Department of Energy has been meeting the 20-day standard for uh, the adjudications on initial investigations, as well as the 30-day OMB standard for uh, for <clears throat> excuse me for the reinvestigations. On the next slide, you'll see where we started out on a monthly trend for the top secret investigations, the T5s, where we weren't meeting the, uh, the adjudication timelines. However, averaging out over the 12-month uh, the time period, you're looking at about an average of about 17 days total. I'm, I'm going through this rather quickly because uh, it's just to keep everybody on track here. Uh, for the Tier 3 investigations, the same thing. We started out roughly uh, just over the, meet, over the IRTPA standard, but uh, since then, we've actually, over the last 12 months, been meeting the IRTPA. And for the T5R investigations, we did see an influx of investigations come in during the uh, early part of the FY. However, we continue to maintain uh, meeting the OMB standard for reinvestigation adjudications. And the same thing with the T5 investigations, we did, uh, did meet it through, or excuse me, T3 investigations, we did meet it throughout the entire fiscal year. Uh, what I'd like to do is also uh, give a quick update on what we're doing for Trusted Workforce Implementation. Uh, we have our order, the DOE order 472.2 is sitting with the Deputy Secretary right now for approval and signature. Uh, we, had plenty, we had plenty of representation across the department to include our industrial partners uh, that were involved in this process and we wanted to thank everybody for that. Uh, since we last met, the department has actually begun deferment of periodic reinvestigations uh, we're working with our internal IT people as well as the SDCSA to uh, get our wrap back implementation rolling. Um, and with the help of our Trusted Workforce Working Group, we have wide representation across the department uh, so that we continue to uh, 
try to meet all the milestones and everything being put out by the executive agents so that we can actually, once we get our entire clear population into the trusted workforce 1.5 state, uh, we can actually start working on that, the uncleared population, the T1, T2, and T4 population. Uh, so we're looking forward to being able to move forward with that. Uh, but we're right now at a 1.25 state, and we're looking to be 1.5 compliant by the end of the FY, um, meaning that milestone of September 30th. Uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn my time over to Eric Person uh, from the Office of Insider Threat Program here at DOE. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, as, as Paul, my colleague, said, I'm Eric Person, Department of Energy, uh, and specifically with the Office of Insider Threat Program. Uh, before I begin, uh, I'd also like to congratulate Greg uh, on his retirement and uh, thank him for his, uh, for his service. Uh, very quickly, uh, just an overview, uh, DOE's Office of Insider Threat Program is the uh, support office uh, for the department's uh, program or insider threat program per the direction of our, what we call our designated senior official or DSO. Uh, our principal focus uh, is to serve in an organized, train and equip uh, modus and to ensure, among other things, or, uh, among other items, uh, that the department's insider threat program is consistent uh, with national insider threat policy uh, and minimum standards, uh, as well as concomitant with national directives and DOE uh, requirements. Uh, also, I should add that uh, transparency and uh, prudent information sharing is a principal focus uh, as we pursue uh, the insider threat program mission at our, at our department, uh, Department of Energy. Uh, our office works uh, closely with our DOE security policy and personnel security colleagues. Uh, in fact, uh, personnel security or PERSEC and uh, physical, physical security uh, representatives are core members of our, uh, what we call our local insider threat working groups or LITWIGs. Uh, the LITWIGs uh, represent uh, the tip of the spear, if you will, uh, for the program in the field. Uh, that is uh, at the various um, national laboratories and uh, DOE sites uh, across the country. Uh, currently, our office is uh, pursuing a number of initiatives to advance the department's mission, uh, our insider threat program mission, uh, to include revising uh, the DOE Order 470.5. Uh, that is the uh, uh, departmental uh, driver, uh, the vehicle uh, uh, that helps us to or enables us to pursue uh, Executive Order 13587, which of course uh, stood up uh, uh, nationwide insider threat programs at all departments and agencies um, across the executive branch. Uh, so again, we're pursuing that in earnest and uh, looking forward to, uh, to a, a positive conclusion in revising that order. Again, it was published in 2014, so it's about eight years old, and so it's, it's in need of uh, some, some retooling. Uh, lastly, our office, uh, via uh, DSO guidance and direction, maintains a robust outreach effort uh, to our public and private sector colleagues and friends. We uh, certainly understand and appreciate uh, the value in uh, fostering uh, those mission-focused relationships. Uh, I'll close there, and uh, thank you for your time. You're most welcome. All right, uh, Chris Heilig, next Chief of Personnel Security Branch, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Please provide your update. Uh, thank you. Um, so in the interest of time, I will not go through all of the slides one by one um, in terms of uh, timeliness numbers. Uh, the gist for last quarter was our numbers did slip a little bit. Um, we ran into some problematic cases that took longer than uh, normal or expected, and we had some issues getting a hold of people um, with the COVID restrictions. But now that everything's reopening, I, I think our trend will be back to normal and meeting our adjudication times um, moving forward. Um, in terms of trusted workforce, uh, we are 1.25 and working actively with DCSA to meet the 1.5 compliant deadline at the end of this fiscal year. Um, and we don't see any reason why we will not hit the 2.0 deadlines as well. Um, uh, also, I would just say we, we're excited to hear about the SF312 moving towards a digital signature. I think that will speed up our internal processes quite a bit, and uh, those onboarding with our agency will, will feel that uh, speed up. Um, that's really all I had, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. All right, now we'll hear from Mr. Perry Hunter, Perry Russell Hunter from the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, also known as DOHA. All right, Perry, yours. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. 
Uh, I want to start by recognizing Greg Pannoni for his over four decades of exemplary public service to the NISP and to the nation. Greg represents the very best of expertise in industrial security and information security and public in general. Uh, so, so, Greg, I want to thank you because uh, you've improved so many things in your time at ISU and at the various things that are now called DCSA. Uh, I, I also uh, I want to join Heather Sims in congratulating DCSA in ongoing improvements to investigation and adjudication and the, their increased focus on quality in, in both areas. Uh, as you all know, Doha renders final decisions independent of DCSA, and that independence in, in hearings, appeals, and final decisions is very important. But a focus on quality in both the investigation and adjudication increases Doha's ability to do its job as effectively and efficiently as possible. So, Doha is still making maximum use of telework, um, except for the personnel who are conducting and supporting the in-person hearings that are obviously a core part of the Doha mission. We're fully masked at all times in all hearings, and we employ a full range of safety precautions in those hearings and in the office. So in these ways, we are maximizing safety to all involved in the hearing process and at Doha. Leveraging telework has not affected Doha productivity, which is thanks to the great partnership between Doha and the Department of Defense Consolidated Adjudications Facility, or DOD-CAF. Statements of reasons, or SORs, are still going out in typical numbers, and we are timely with 257 statements of reasons reviews currently pending. That number is well within the typical on-hand SOR review workload. So while the monthly numbers may vary slightly, we are current and most SOR reviews are completed within the month received. However, at any given time, there may be a smaller group of SORs for which there are requests for additional information, requests for permission to use other agencies' documents, and other good reasons why a, a serious issue case needs some work. Just for context, uh, between 2017 and 2019, pre-pandemic, we reviewed a typical average of 2,600 SORs per year. In fiscal year 2021, Doha Legal reviewed and revised uh, 3,021 statements of reasons, which is higher than an average number. And in calendar year 2021, we reviewed 2,578 SORs. So Doha kept up with all the draft SORs sent by the CAF for legal review and worked at a typical operating pace despite the pandemic using DOD SAFE uh, as a delivery system to ensure a secure workflow. While the pandemic was impacting the hearing process due to travel and because Doha was having challenges with conventional video teleconferencing, Doha made good use of the Defense Communication System, or DCS, throughout fiscal year 2021 to conduct remote online virtual hearings for clearance holders and clearance applicants in locations where travel would still be unsafe or which could not be reached using conventional VTC. With the sunset of DCS, Doha is now holding hearings using Microsoft Teams 365, Doha has also continued to hold in-person hearings throughout the pandemic whenever and wherever possible, and we will continue to do so. And that is the report from Doha. Thank you very much, Perry. All right, up next is Greg Pannoni, Associate Director for the Controlled Unclassified Information Program at ISO. Greg? Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, CUI. So, uh, just a couple things, a couple, three things I want to mention. Um, as stated before, ISU has a lot of reporting requirements, and one of those is CUI implementation. So, we have to report that to the President as well, and we'll be doing that very soon. Uh, most agencies and departments have begun implementing their CUI programs. Um, as we talked about a little yesterday, yes, there's some challenges. And speaking of challenges, I, I do want to emphasize, because I've heard not just in this uh, forum but in others, folks will say, well, we, we don't get information as far as the identity of what CUI we're just told to protect it. There is, just like with the classification program, there's, there's, a, classifi there's a CUI, I should say, challenge provision. And so, you know, we encourage to do it informally, but there's a formal process as well. And it's, it's written into the regulation, and every agency knows about it. So I highly recommend it if you're seeing requirements in contracts, but they're 
written in a very generic way, you know, that lacks specificity, that, that provision exists for a reason. And anyone who comes into possession accesses CUI, or they're not sure if it's CUI or questions it, they have that avenue to pursue. You know, it may be a little clunky, but it's there. Um, I also want to mention the, the CUI Federal Acquisition Regulation, known as the FAR case. Uh, it's still moving through the process. Uh, I know it's taken a long time. We don't control that in ISU. The, the council is led by GSA, along with DOD and NASA. Uh, we're doing as much as we can to move things through, have any specific timelines for, for when that FAR clause will be completed for CUI. Uh, but in the meantime, DOD has the DFARS clause. Um, the, the other thing I want to mention about CUI that we've tried to do, I've tried to do when I became involved, is to, to try to, you know, because I recognize there's a lot of clunkiness, if you will, to the thing so many categories. And one of the things I tried to do besides establishing deadlines, since we're going to have a program, was to neck down the number of CUI specified categories, because that just, in my view, adds to the confusion. And so we've been working on that, and we have reduced some specified into CUI basic. So you know there's CUI basic, there's two types of CUI, basic and specified. And specified is supposed to mean because there's specificity in the law, government-wide policy, or regulation that dictates either how to protect the information and or limit its dissemination. And most often it is that limited dissemination part. And we have found a way where we can use that as basic and still preserve the controls because the basic controls are still acceptable in a lot of cases. So that's all I want to say. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to try and take them. Uh, Greg. Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad that it, it came up. I, I just would sim simply add, right, so uh, the department continues to take a measured approach uh, as it relates to CUI. Uh, again, we, we would be remiss if we didn't thank ISU for uh, its support in, uh, in the limited implementation that the department continues to pursue. I'd note, again, with an eye for transparency, it was very encouraging to hear the updates from the other CSAs today, such as they are, right, kind of warts and all. Uh, it, it is challenging. It is cumbersome. But we can't be acknowledging of the, you know, one, the growing reliance on unclassified information that supports, uh, you know, the, the missions that are represented across the CSAs and not understand the absolute need to be able to identify with specificity, uh, you know, the, the, the information that will then, uh, you know, trigger things like cybersecurity requirements. And so I appreciate the nod to the DFAR rule that the department has. The DFAR rule is written in a very specific and, uh, and a set of ways largely predicated on identifying cybersecurity, but we get ourselves into a bit of a vicious cycle because we haven't, we, we, we really need to focus in on the identification piece of this thing, which is uh, <coughs> up uh, a, a, fair, a fair bit of uh, um, our prioritization at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Greg and, and uh, Jeffrey. All right, we're now at the point of the meeting where we ask for NISPAC members to present any new business they may have. Does anyone have any new business for us? Hi, this is Heather Sims, Industry. Just real quickly, I want to make sure it's part of the record. I missed, um, during my opening comments, uh, a special thanks to Dave Scott for his partnership and uh, great improvement in uh, collaboration uh, through the NISA Working Group, as well as Keith Menard on the 32 CFR. Uh, implementation and continuing uh, clarifying guidance. But I also wanted to note um, during the GSA presentation, I, I wanted it noted that um, GSA is now a sole source provider for containers for industry. And I want it noted that a 30%, 40%, 50% rise in the cost is, is instrumental when we're looking at uh, industry trying to get containers to um, for new contracts, existing contracts. So it is definitely an impediment to our operations as well as the timelines um, ever increasing to get those containers. Thank right. No, indeed. Okay. Thank you, Heather. All right. Do any other committee members have any questions or remarks before we close out this meeting? All right. Hearing none, our next NISPAC is scheduled for November 2nd, 2022. We we're hoping to have the next NISPAC in person, uh, but we'll also obviously have backup plans for 100% virtual if we, uh, we have to.
As a reminder, all NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Register approximately 30 days before the meeting, along with being posted to the ISOO blog. With that, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you all, and please stay safe.